It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 291 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 25th of March 2018. My name's Ed Brown and joining me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey. And on the show today we'll be talking about how children draw scientists, how a nearby star messed with our solar system, and what declining newspaper circulation means for epidemiologists. But before that, of course, you can help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. Greatly appreciate all the help we get from the listeners who contribute. But let's begin with the Draw a Scientist study. Back in the 1960s, a landmark study asked 4,807 school children to, well, draw a scientist. And of those drawings, only 28 of them drew a female scientist, which is about 0.6%. That study was replicated recently and published last week. Penny, the children drew a lot more women. Yeah, up to 28%. Um, Yeah, so it's not quite sexism over. (laughs) (laughs) But it's getting, you can see that there's a trend there. And I, I was drawn to this because I'm a science teacher and this is an activity that we often do, not so much to, you know, drill down into children's perceptions of gender and scientists, but more to start a conversation. Oh, not all scientists work in labs and, you know, not all scientists are men. I find that with my students I teach at a girls' school, there, there tends to be a balance of female and male scientists. Like, you know, these girls are very aware that women can be in all sorts of different professions and including science. And I think they're also aware of this kind of activity. Like they've done things like this before and people have said, no, you know, isn't it interesting that you've all drawn men? And then they think, oh, yeah. So it's not it, – it's, it's, I do the activity to start a conversation about, you know, the, the range of people that – because sometimes you do get groups where it is 100% lab coat 700 like different colored chemicals and a few explosions and you know not much recognition of <laughs> any other kind of yeah. science so i actually was unsurprised but happy to read this that, that children are drawing more female scientists and i'm guessing that a variety of roles as well um it's still not exactly parity so i think it's a it's a, a good um sort of yardstick that it is still regarded as a kind of a male dominated profession i mean even shows like the big bang theory which would be a lot of um children's popular culture experience of science is um very male dominated even though there are women in there um yeah what I also thought was interesting was they looked at um, like a meta-analysis of studies and the youngest children, um, especially the youngest girls, were far more likely to draw female scientists. But by the time they get to the end of primary school, so sort of 10 or 11 and certainly by about 16, uh, girls are drawing, about 75% of girls were drawing scientists as men. Wow. That's really interesting. We're somehow drumming out of them the idea that girls can be scientists. And the idea is it's maybe because of representation that they become more aware of, you know, and a lot of fields of science. It would be interesting if to drill down into physicists versus biologists versus whatever, but, you know, a lot of fields of science are, represent, are very male-dominated and represented as such and, um, and so on. Yeah, but that's really interesting that that progression happens as they get older, the parity decreases. That's really interesting and disturbing. I mean, there's clearly something happening that they're becoming more disillusioned, perhaps, or just they don't see that there's that same equal opportunity. And, and maybe this is an effect more, more just an overall effect that they're um, that they're exposed to. The shutting down of pathways, I guess, as they move further on through school, mm. that they 
you know, wouldn't uh, I very much doubt this would be restricted well, yeah. to sciences. It probably well, is. Well, interestingly, they, they were reported there was another study where it was for primary school student. Um, sixty-six percent of scientists were men in this the in this study, but children drew thought forty percent of vets as men. So that's seen as more female dominated, and twenty-five percent of teachers as men. Mm-hmm. So it's it's they're kind of accurately reflecting their experience of from whatever it is, because most children don't necessarily have direct experiences of scientists, but experiences of what is presented to them and what's more realistic. Apparently younger children are more likely to draw their own gender. So girls in some, in more recent studies, girls drew female scientists about 45% of the time, boys did 5% of the time, but that's not unexpected. Children usually draw themselves. But, yeah, it's interesting that as they grew older, girls then flipped from drawing female scientists to male scientists i wonder if that's also that they start getting more of a negative uh, messages as they get older and they get more adults saying oh you can't be a scientist Mm because you have to be good at maths Mm -hmm. and girls can't do maths or something like that they get these outdated notions uh exposed to them i guess or even and i mean i'm not a psychologist but even just kids get better at sort of predicting what is expected and more aware of stereotypes. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if I say draw a house, like the kind of house that gets drawn isn't necessarily a realistic house. It's something that's instantly recognisable as a house. So someone in a lab coat and goggles in a lab has all of these kind of um, hallmarks of scientists and maybe being male is one of them. If I say draw a scientist, you want me to know that it's a scientist Making him a male in a white coat is a way to just signal that. Anyway, I thought this was interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. it is. I think there's an element of good news to it, but there's also that element of it's not all good news and there's a long way to go still. It does remind me, though, of various things I've read, which I don't, I haven't ever looked up original studies that, you know, when once women get to about 30% rep- representation, people say, oh, you know, it's a bit woman heavy. And it's not even 50-50. So I wonder that 30%, 28%, I'm like, yeah, I wonder if there is this kind of really deeply ingrained belief that, you know, men are scientists. So you try and add a few women or a few people consciously add women, but that stereotype is just so powerful. I don't know. Anyway. It's funny. I'm just thinking anecdotally from my, you know, my particular experience, I know way more female scientists than, than male scientists. Like yeah. I'm, I'm struggling to think of male scientists that I know who like, and I and I guess I'm um this is just in terms of uh, scientists working in that stereotypical lab sort of environment. I I mainly know women who do that. That's just bizarre. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's some sort of weird selection bias that I have. It's. I think there is a degree of selection bias in the terms of like. We actively try and have more women guests on the show. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's likely that you're going to meet more women through that than through men. But uh, that's probably it. It's your fault. Good on you. <laughs> <laughs> you can wear that one with pride, though, dude. I'm happy about it. Uh, and I do. But I will say, I think it is interesting if you think of the high-profile scientists, uh, mm. the people you see in the media a lot. Very few of them are women. Oh yeah. You often yeah. see your Neil yeah, deGrasse Tyson, may he rest in peace. Thing, but you know, yeah, 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 yep. And that goes to the exposure thing that we're talking about. Um, and again, the Big Bang Theory, mentioning Neil deGrasse Tyson mm. and Hawking, who have both been on it. Mm. Let's have a look back in time now to seventy thousand years ago, when a small red dwarf star and its companion binary star hurtled through space and came within a light year of our sun. Lucas Schultz star is now about 20 light years away, but its flyby likely disrupted the orbits of a lot of comets and asteroids in our solar system. Yep. (laughs) I really love orbital mechanics. I just think it's so cool. And I, (laughs) it's one of those things that, um, I, I've sort of developed this kind of, theory of of human inter- interactions that i describe along the lines of, of three body interactions that where the gravity the gravitational effects of one 
one celestial body can have an effect on on others and and if you have two two bodies that are that are you know in a nice stable orbit to each other one another one can come along and just completely perturb that orbit and and, and then potentially throw one out i i just i just love this the symbology of that when it when you you know compare it to human interaction because it seems to so often follow suit as well but i there's a i think i've mentioned on the show a number of times there's a um I can't even remember what the, what the thing is called anymore, but there's a, a very cool simulation tool out there that allows you to play around with orbits of yeah. things by dialing up different numbers. And you can basically have fun trying to eject planets out of, you know, star systems by throwing other planets into, into the inner system and, and this sort of thing. And it, it's just, it's just so cool. Um, I didn't, I don't, I, I don't recall reading a great deal about Schultz's star after the original um, papers about it because I'm, I'm pretty sure we covered it on the show because I do I do remember a little bit, but it's just not something that's come up all that much since then. No, it was discovered in 2013. That's right. So in 2013 it was discovered and, and that was when most of the coverage was um, and there were indications that that Schultz at star, and as you say, it's its companion, which is a brown dwarf. So it's a re, it's a it's a a red dwarf with a brown dwarf companion. So brown dwarfs are the, really the smallest ones. They they're often considered almost failed stars. Basically, they're 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 teeny tiny, but bigger than all the planets that we have. So um, it's known uh, based on on uh, Dieter Schultz's discovery that that uh, it did come through our celestial neighbourhood. Uh, about 70,000 uh, years ago, within a light year. It's thought maybe it came to even closer than 0.6 light years. So that's well within the outer reaches of our of, of, of the sun's influence. Uh, if you think of the, the Oort cloud, which is, you know, beyond the Kuiper belt, it's where all, a lot of these um, uh, objects that, that's just um, basically ice, it's mainly icy objects that are just, just floating around in this cloud, they're still under the gravitational influence of the sun. So they are in a very, very slow sort of web or net of an orbit around around our star. Um, this this uh, Schultz's star and its and its companion came scooting on by and, and basically it perturbed the orbit of a lot of things that were in the Oort cloud, a lot of these objects. And there's a new study that's that's had a look at uh, basically plotting a, the the orbital pathways of a lot of these objects that have since ended up with a very hyperbolic um, uh, orbit, which which rather than than you know the typical orbits you you see around a star, uh, which are elliptical, a hyperbolic orbit is more of a V-shaped sort of orbit. So it it really does you know sling in towards the the star and then back out again very very rapidly. So if you think of um, you know, some of the orbits of comets might be quite hyperbolic because they, they come in and, and slingshot back out again and we don't see them for, you know, a long, long time until they come back around again. So they're really, really sort of stretched out orbits. So they've had a look at a whole lot of objects that have got this type of orbit and they've mapped, using the observational data that we have, they've mapped what um, the, or, or calculated what the positions of these are in terms of the entire orbit. And, and these these um, these orbits or radiants that they've been able to uh, to calculate give us an indication of where they come from. And there's a, a particular area of the Oort cloud where a lot of these seem to seem to originate, which is over towards Gemini, and uh, obviously you nowhere know, near actual Gemini, but it's in that direction. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it is a is a pinpoint on the sky. So basically, they've used these numerical estimations to calculate these these radiants or positions in the sky and and that in itself has been really interesting because that's this is exactly the area of the sky that it would uh it it was already believed that Schultz's star had passed through about 70,000 years ago it's also shown that it appears that Schultz's star may have been even come even closer than had previously thought based on these gravitational interactions and I guess what just thrills me about this sort of study, and there's some really cool graphics about this as well, like there's one that actually shows um, a plot of all of these objects in the Oort cloud around around the sun. And it's just, it, 
It's similar to if you've ever seen the plots of um, uh, space junk and, and, you know, man-made material around the Earth. You can sort of zoom yeah. in and out of that yeah. and, and see this vast web of material. It's really a, it's, it's very disturbing to see how much crap there is that's actually, mm-hmm. yeah, it's rotating thousands. around the Earth. And, and if you've got, you know, even um, some of those satellite tracking apps, if you've got some of those on your phone or whatever, you can point them up above your head. And at any one time, you can often see bits of rockets that, that are still, you know, stages of rockets that are still in orbit around the Earth going right back to the 60s and, you know, and since then all the way through. And that, it's just, it's amazing to think that stuff is all up there and that, that it has to be tracked so that they don't hit it. Uh, but the Oort cloud puts that to shame. I mean, there's just so many objects in the Oort cloud. But, but as I say, what I love about this is that using this data, they can extrapolate so much information and then seeing these swarms of material, uh, swarms of objects being being twisted and slingshot, you know, towards the sun, and some would have been flung away from the sun as well. It just it gives you almost like this ghost ripple effect that that infers the pathway of of Schultz's star, which is it's just amazing to think that we can do this based on something that happened quite a, a long time ago. The authors did point out that there is a a little bit of a problem with with their study in that. There hasn't been sufficient time for um, for long observations of, of some of the objects that they've they've included in the study because Oort cloud stuff tends to move slow. So as it's you know pathway, some mm. of the things have have either only only come in or been observed to come in once so far, or you know they've, they've only had a, a just a tiny fraction of their their orbital pathway observed. So that means that the extrapolated data might not be accurate, but it all is pointing towards a very clear signal. So even if some of them are wrong, they, the authors have said, look, we, we know it might not be exactly correct, but it certainly is pretty damn close. So um, it's, it's just it's a beautiful illustration of, of orbital mechanics. It is. And also, I didn't realize how far away the Oort cloud was. Yeah, well, that's about one and a half light years. So it's 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 a very very vast distance. And some some of the um, documentaries and so forth that I've seen over the years, and and especially when you start looking at the how far out v- the Voyager probes have gone, um, mm. in terms mm. of, of uh, 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 are they at the edge of our solar system? And it keeps on going. And uh, we've mentioned a few times on the show that you know there's a, uh, every time they go, they're finally at the heliopause, and now there's a new thing, which is a this. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, these things are a long way out now, and and um, you know that the, the yeah. our our star, our sun has does have an influence that extends a, an ex- extremely long way, and uh, yeah, and as far as the Oort cloud is concerned, it's it's really deep. It's not just a shell around around the sun. Well, it ranges from it, it starts at about 0.8 of a light year away from the sun, and extends out to 3.2 light years away from the sun. When you consider that our nearest star is 4.3 light years away, you could argue that part of the Oort cloud is more under the uh, Alpha Centauri's gravitational influence than it is our own sun. Yeah, uh, you're right. That's really cool. It is cool. And it also, I think, it shows you that even though the, the distances between the stars are so vast, um, they still have significant influence on each other. And when you look at a galactic disk, and you look at the, you know, like taking the Milky Way, for example, and what, what we believe we know about these, the, the barred spiral galaxy in which we live, we are interacting with other stars, not us personally, but, the, you know, the, the solar system is interacting with other stars and it has, you know, to, to, to borrow uh, Dr. Maynard Casely's uh, 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 comment, it has a wobble to it in terms of going up <laughs> and down along the galactic plane and they're, they're always interacting with each other. So, you know, we are not alone. The other cool thing was I actually looked up uh, Schultz's star on Wikipedia and there's a line that said, uh, and it's talking about the solar system flyby and all that, but there's a line that says, a star is expected to pass through the Oort cloud every 100,000 years or so. Now that seems awfully common from an astronomical sense. 
And I'm a, I want to know when the next uh, star is coming from because that's about thirty thousand years away. <laughs> yeah, and as you say, this is you know it. They can they can put time frames on it, but th- that's a little bit like the the estimates of how often we would expect to see a supernova within any particular part of the galaxy. Um, on average, it could be X, but in reality, it might be ten times that amount between any one individual and the next. Uh, uh, instance um if it's also that like the the likelihood of yellowstone supervolcano erupting or uh, <laughs> the magnetic field flipping it's like well it tends to happen roughly every x thousand years but you mm. know maybe not it is cool and i i just as i say just anything that shows these orbital interactions and how throwing one object past another object mm. cause so much mayhem it's just so cool to watch. Yeah, definitely. Okay, but let's talk about an observation that isn't very new. The internet is killing newspapers. It's not a new thought. And in the last 10 years or so, we've seen a dramatic decrease in newspaper circulation. And that's especially true of local newspapers. Local news outlets in general, really, including TV and radio. But Penny, what's that got to do with epidemiology? Interestingly, quite a bit. So I we um, read an article about saying, you know, local newspapers are dying a lot of areas, and this article focused on the United States, but I'm pretty sure this would be a global phenomenon. Um, there's a lot of areas that just don't have local newspaper coverage anymore. Like Even my local newspaper, I think, now has merged with the other ones around it and is a lot thinner than I remember it being when I was young. You know, so there are sort of black zones of local newspaper coverage. And apparently, local newspapers are used by projects like Health Map or ProMed, which essentially track information about infectious diseases, so epidemiological information, not through official channels like um, reports from doctors' offices and so on, which I get the impression from reading this, I'm no expert in the field, but go through several thousand layers of red tape before they can be kind of used. But more real-time stuff from social media and local news outlets to track what's happening with infectious diseases in real time. So not necessarily at the end of the month or the, you know, whatever quarterly reporting period, but what's actually happening in a community. And local newspapers have been significantly quite important because I guess in a way that social media may not do, they do bring together somewhat trustworthy reportage of what's going on and a bit more context. So they can say, oh, yeah, you know, there's an outbreak of measles in the community and blah, 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 the people who live in this area are all anti-vaxxers or, you know, the outbreaks concentrated in a community of people who have come from a different area. So you get an idea of a bit more of an idea that of what's going on than maybe people self-reporting different symptoms. Mm. So I remember taking part in a study, I don't remember what it was called, but I think it was called Flu Tracker, where I'd say every week if anyone in my household had a cold or a fever or a sniffer and whether or not we'd had our flu vaccination and so on. But, and I'm sure that kind of data is quite useful but I guess what this is saying is because if my local paper published an article about oh humongous you know outbreak of flu in Melbourne centered around Melbourne schools blah 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 that could actually be quite useful for epidemiologists to find out in a way that oh yeah there's a few extra reports on this flu tracker but it doesn't necessarily. But not everyone is on flu tracker. Not everyone is on flu tracker, or not everyone goes to the doctor, or you know, and so on. So I just thought that was interesting. So my gut feeling when I read this, I was just like, um, "Oh, but surely there's Facebook, right? Surely all this stuff is on Facebook." But I guess um, even Facebook and Twitter and whatever, it, it's not necessarily going to have that extra information. Yeah. But not everyone's on Facebook and not everyone has that sort of thing publicly available. A lot of people are now 
not that it matters if you're Cambridge Analytica, but a lot of people are more uh, private about that sort of information. So it's like my poll yeah. was also the same to use social media. That's the alternative to local news these days, but it's not going to give you the same level of detail, I think. And it's also not going to give you that fact checking. Like you might get a really loud voice on social media saying, oh, this is happening because the government's poisoning our water supply or something. <laughs> All right. But if that story is picked up and then reported on, you would hopefully assume that there would be a greater level of fact checking happening than just that social media explosion. Like, yeah, just food for thought, I suppose. Just the, cha- the way that the changing news landscape can perhaps affect our public health programs. But I wonder if there's also maybe that points to a, a, another area that maybe we could work on, which is getting mm. uh, public health officials to make that sort of data more available. So if you do go to the doctor because you've got flu-like symptoms, mm. then if there was some mechanism where they would report it anonymously even, it would be counted in the data and that would be available. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. The, the other option is to support your local newspapers, support your local media, and, you know, support your local favourite podcast as well. Why not? You can do that <laughs> by going to really. scienceontop.com slash donate. <laughs> uh but also go to scienceontop.com slash 291 for all the show notes and links that we talked about and a chance to leave your feedback there or find us on social media. Uh, thank you for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. No worries, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. The coffee cancer battle has been brewing in California for years. And on Thursday, Starbucks and other retailers were roasted. Some 90 retailers named in the suit will now be required to post warnings that a chemical found in coffee may cause cancer. Acrylamide is formed naturally when coffee is brewed. In studies, high doses of acrylamide has caused cancer in mice.